Let me tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I started as a beekeeper on uh, my first beehive was five years old. Uh, this became a famous uh, picture and quite a few of the bee magazines back in the 1950s. Uh, myself as a five-year-old, my dad with my first beehive. And I can still remember the experience because we started uh, my own beehive that, that spring and got started. And my dad said, I'll do a lifting, but you're going to do the managing of the hive. And he said, whoever wins and gets more honey than the other person, they're going to take them out to eat. That's when you went out to eat once a, once a year if you were lucky with a family of five children. Um, and so that season went by. I was all excited as a five-year-old. They just come out of kindergarten. And uh, my dad says, I, I think I'm going to get you. I think I'm getting more honey. Uh, I'm being a fourth. Uh, he's a fifth-generation beekeeper. Goes back to 1840s. So now I know he wanted a sixth-generation beekeeper that would stay with it for his whole life. So I, we went along. That fall, August 30th, he'd always take all honey and then leave the rest for the bees. He was a big believer in keeping the bees healthy, giving them enough honey and not taking all their honey and giving them sugar syrup. Uh, that was his philosophy. So all of a sudden, we go in, we weighed up his honey in the hive, 76 pounds. He said, I got you. I know I got you. I, I was, my face was down, a five-year-old, what do you know? And so he did say, he says, ah, you're going to have to take me out to eat. You're going to have to save your money from the honey yourself. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> so anyway, we weighed up my honey, 87 pounds. <laughs> oh, my. You beat me. How did you do that? I, I can't figure out what's your secret. You know, I, what was he doing? I, at that time, I think, my head's like this. Mom, <laughs> my beat dad, I got more honey. He said, I got a secret that, that I have, and I'm a great beekeeper. So I read my mother to this day, to this day, you remember that. Uh, so, you know, I was all excited. We went to the bungalow down the street. Mr. Odette was the chef. He was the bottle washer, and he was the, he cleaned the tables. He did everything. There was only four tables in the place. <laughs> what did I pick? The most expensive meal on, a, on the uh, menu, the steak dinner for two ninety five. <laughs> you know, so I was all excited. And that's how I got into it, and I stuck with it my whole life. I've never been away from beekeeping. I don't know what it is. I know I never will be without it. I'm not going to keep the 150 hives that I have, but I will definitely cut back at some point here uh, to ease up lifting. Most people think beekeeping is an easy thing. It's a tough job. It's a lot of work. Lifting 100-pound boxes, 30-pound, 40-pound boxes, lifting them up, putting them back on, take, lifting them off. You got to check those bees once a week. So it's a lot of work, but it's fun. The one thing I found when you go into the beehive as a hobby, so for you who might be thinking about it, it's so relaxing when you get to know bees. Sometimes I was stressed coming home from teaching and, you know, I'd go into that beehive forget about everything around you because you're so careful making sure that you're not going to hurt the bees that did you're going to be calm you want to keep them calm and if you work them correctly bees are very workable it's amazing I think the beekeepers can tell you around here I can work a beehive for an hour and not have bees come at me now not to say they won't sting you they get angry but if you know how to work them. And when you're in there, it's such an amazing thing that you see. Come right in. There we are, the Antosis. <laughs> One time 40 year beekeepers. Thank you. Come on in, Jane. Right here. Oh, okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. They must be coming in to get a little more experience. <laughs> uh, so, you go into the beehive and you forget about everything. I, I can remember uh, uh, one of the psychiatrists in our, in our club came up me, wanted to come out one day with me to see what beekeeping was all about. I took her out and she said, oh my God, this is such a distressing type of hobby. She came out just for the day. She got into it. Even through being allergic reaction, she got, she overcame it, went to desensitize. She loves the hobby. It's like, say, for psychiatrists, 
she loves to go out there and distress herself uh, going into the beehives. It is the very calming, quiet, and you, you come out of it, you're just so relaxed. Seeing the amazing bees feeding the baby bees, seeing, seeing the bees fanning, seeing the bees doing cleaning the hive, polishing the cells. As you focus, you see all this, and they're working together like they all know what their job is. They're so organized. If we could only be like that, human beings, I'd say we'd be a better society. So anyway, I got into it, Harvey, through high school, all my projects were beekeeping projects. My sophomore project, I won the, the uh, science fair on the beekeeping. I had a whole display on honeybees and beekeeping. And back then even, kids could come and see that observation hive and everybody's mystified. And they see an observation hive, oh my god. And so I did my project, my college project was uh, with, with honeybees and I went into the military. I couldn't get to my honeybees, but I shook bees <coughs> for a package company to stay with the bees. And then it came out and my dad and I started with 150 beehives. And I've been doing it ever since. And uh, that's been my job uh, as a beekeeper. And my final kind of touches on it when I retired from teaching, I'm 38 years. Harvard University called me up and said, Ken, Dr. Lou from Harvard University, we need one study on, on honeybees, a six year study to find out why they're dying. And so I said, because my wife was expecting to do some travel. She was expecting to, we were going to go a trip to uh, France and England right on my retirement from teaching. And that's when Dr. Lou approached me and he said, Ken, we got to get this study going. The bees are dying alarming rates. The professors want to get involved with this study. We want you to run the beehives. He said, Dr. Wu, we're supposed to travel with my wife for some time. He said, Ken, this is for the bees. It made me feel guilty. I took it on. I didn't even say anything to my wife. And then two weeks later, it was two weeks later, Jeff Pettis, the chief scientist from Beltsville, calls me up and said, Ken, this Asian longhorn beetle is struck. We have to inject the trees with a deadly pesticide called imacloprid. We need to set up 40 hives to find out the effects on this tree injection. I said, <laughs> and I knew Jeff from before, and I said, Jeff, I just got called by Harvard, my wife and I were going to travel. And so I said to Jeff, I said, I don't know. He said, Ken, this is for your country. You know? So I didn't tell my wife. I sat it down one night. I said, Deb, some of you know my wife. She can get temperamental. <laughs> All of a sudden, I said, Deb, sit down. You want some honey, tea, and lemon? <laughs> she said, what's wrong? <laughs> what's wrong? Tell me. Oh, nothing wrong. I said, you want some honey tea? No, no, just tell me. I said, you know how we're going to travel? Yeah, when are we going? I said, well, I took on two studies, and for the next six years, I'm going to be tied up with two studies on honeybees. She says, go ahead, I know your love for honeybees. And so I got involved. That was the kind of the topping on everything that kind of gave me that sense of, I've reached the top of where I can reach. And to this day though, I haven't lost that interest in honeybees. I'm still there. But the bees are threatened for the people that are beekeepers here. Just so you know, we are losing bees at alarming rates throughout the world. Mm -hmm. Not only in the United States, number of factors, that's one of the things we looked at with the Harvard study. Since then, there have been many studies that have looked on many factors and they've come to kind of one logic conclusion. Obviously, this mite that came in in 1989, the rural mite, was the leading, one of the leading factors. The bees just can't combat it. Bees in the wild disappearing, 80, 100 percent of them. Bee trees don't survive. So man has to come in and, and help out. 
Secondly, six new viruses have come into the scene, into the picture. Six new viruses are never there before. Thirdly, the amicloprid and these systemic pesticides are weakening the immune system of the honeybee, which now four studies have shown, and they can't fight off these viruses. There were viruses back in the 50s when I was growing up. But the bees could fight them off, held them at bay. Now, the weakened mm -hmm. immune system from the, the systemic pesticides, along with the mite constantly at them, spreading and vectoring those viruses even quicker, mm -hmm. what we're seeing is a battle that the bees have on their hands. They need us more than ever. And I'll probably touch on what you can do as beekeepers or, or non-beekeepers to help the honeybees. And like I say, what was once a beautiful partnership, I want to just share with you this quick passage and don't get into the program. At one time, it was only the permitted years, it was the bees and the flowers. It was a love affair. Let me read this. This is a beautiful 1939 from this book. I, I picked it out as my favorite passage. Go to your fields and to your gardens, and you shall learn that it is the pleasure of the bees to gather the honey of the flower. But it is also the pleasure of the flower to yield its honey to the bee. For to the bee, a flower is a fountain of life. And to the flower, a bee is a messenger of love. And to both the bee and the flower, the giving and receiving of pleasure is a need and an ecstasy. So be it in your pleasures, like the flowers and the bees. We now, I'm thinking about rewriting that passage. It's a three-way love affair. The people have loved the honeybees and trying to save them, along with the flowers, by like planting flowers that they need, by helping the honeybees, treating for these mites, and doing what they can. We can't, even with what we're doing, we can't, still haven't found the success. We're still losing, even in the good year, like this year, we're happy with 35% losses. Two years ago, we had 55% losses in Massachusetts. The year after that, we had 50%. The last two years, 35 and 39%. And hoping we get back to the day of 5% in the 1950s, my dad accepted 5%. In 1958, he's got right in his book in Polish, he lost. 15%, he was beside himself. What did I do? What did I do wrong? He couldn't understand why he lost 15% when the average was five. Today we'd be thrilled with 15%. Yeah. But, you know, we're losing. And these bee suppliers can't keep supplying at that rate. There's, there's a big conference with USDA and all the bee producers, because they know they can see it coming. The almonds couldn't get enough bees to pollinate. So the bees are threatened. People think that this is a gimmick. This is not a gimmick. I see it, even myself, as much as I do, I lose 25%, 30% of my bees. And I, I do everything I can, and yet you lose them. Because, you know, they're fighting the mite, they're fighting those viruses and the immune system and the weakened immune system from the pesticides that they're going through because these are now in the plants. Years ago, they'd put them on, they'd wash off. Mm -hmm. Now, they're systemic. So they'd be infected by the, these uh, systemic pesticides. So, hopefully we're gonna have a better outlook. And you know, this program, Save the Bees, is getting out more and more. And I know that's why more and more beekeepers have come into the picture. They wanna help, but not at the help. We all have got to work together on solving what we're doing wrong, maybe, to also to help improve things. So, you know, it's a multi-layered uh, effect. Okay, now, let me start off with the program here. Dynamics in the beehive. I'm going to take you into a little beehive and see what goes on to this beehive. So for you folks that are new beekeepers, uh, the older beekeepers have seen this, but we'll talk about some things 
at a little more advanced level as we go along. Dynamics of the beehive, like I say, this has been going on for millions of years, these dynamics. So those haven't changed. It's what we've done that has changed the dynamics. And that's why we have to reverse that and get it back to what the dynamics used to be. But like I say, I've been at this thing forever. You can see here how long I've been at it. <laughs> hey, you can see me at the parting of the seas <laughs> with Moses. And after this event was over, you can see my beehive was right there. My tail. I'd go back down to the Nile and work the beehives along the Nile. And so I've been at it a long, long time, needless to say. And by the way, that King Touch honey there, still good. After 3,000 years in that urn, it's still viable honey. Isn't that amazing? Bacteria don't grow in it. And, but now I, you can see myself there, five-year-old. I think that way it was bee culture or data, data magazine that put that out and that picture was in there in 1959. But for new people, can you imagine opening up a hive just like this and looking in at 60,000 bees, each with their two eyes looking up at you and saying, who is that? Can you imagine? And yet they don't come at you. So gentle and so calm, as long as they're not being hurt. If you start squeezing and crushing them and killing them, they're going to fight. They're going to sting. Because they do have that defense. But they, beekeepers can tell you, work them on the right day, the right way, and they're very calm and gentle. You know how many times I've seen Jane no veil and working the bees over the years and, and you know, not a sting. And it's just a matter of respecting the bees, like my dad used to say. Because when he took me for that first six months old at the 50th anniversary of Worcester County Beekeepers in West Boston, it was a summer day in July. Hot, hot, I'm in a diaper. And this is the story I was given by my mother. By my mother, my father, the woman back then, by the way, who did quilt, knit under the trees with the kids. It was a male hobby. There were only two women in the whole Worcester County Beekeepers in the 50s, one from Lancaster, and uh, the other one was from uh, Town of Warren. So the rest were males, old guys like myself now, all around the beehive, saying, Charlie, this is the way you do it. Harry, you're on. This is the way you do it. My dad went over, he was a younger guy, and brought me over to the beehive, took up my mother, my mother had no idea. All of a sudden my mother looks over, here's all these old guys, bees flying all over, open the hive. Dad's got me in his arms, they presented me as a new member. My mother came flying over. <laughs> Walter, Walter, he's gonna get stunned. <laughs> Helen, go back to your knitting, it only hurts for a minute. <laughs> that's the story and he kept me there for a hive opening so that was my first hive opening uh, ever as a beekeeper so anyway that's what it looks like um, mystifying and by the way I show you this because dynamics in a beehive there's a lot can go wrong naturally I'm not saying the bees can't stumble on their own they can there's a lot of things, they lose their queen, or, you know, they, they get hit with a bacteria, so things can happen. But I show this picture because, you notice, up here in this part of the country, the bees started at 8,000, they build up and build up, and reach a peak by May and June. Up here, millions of years have done this to them. So they start small, in January, with the smallest of their cluster they're gonna have, and they slowly build up to peak. So by the end of May, they're at the peak. Well, what else is at its peak here? All the flowers up here blooming, the berries, the fruit, the gardens. So guess what? 
That love affair between bee and flower, that's what she's talking about. It's that love affair, and it was, they didn't say, hey, humans need pollination to get food. Let's go do the job. They did it because they need the food, and the flower gives them the pollen and the nectar. And the flower needs the pollination to produce the fruit. What a beautiful affair between flower and bee. But it can't happen. It's not happening. We need to be put into that picture. And that's their playground. I like to call it the playground. But it's not a playground. It's a work ground. They just constantly work. And every six weeks they're dying because they work themselves to death. And so here you see a huge field with all kind of flowers, clover in the spring, dandelions early in the spring. Then it went to goldenrod, went to Joe Pieweed. And the bees go to all these plants and they know exactly which ones. And they grab the pollen and the nectar and they pollinate. And they come back to the hive. They go three miles, as much as three miles. And even more, in some cases, extreme circumstances. We did a study with the Harvard. We, we, we put them five miles away, Mark bees. We brought them five miles just to see, and they were able to find their way back. Those Mark bees came back five miles, direct distance, so they can find their way. And that had been proven before, but Jeff Pettis said, let's, let's see. Let's see what happens here. And we did. So then they go from flower to flower all day. 4.30 in the morning. They're up now, 4.30 in the morning, that light starts up. As long as it's like 65 degrees and up, they're out there. And they don't stop. The last of them are coming into the hive. I can see them in my backyard about 8.30, quarter, 9 at night. They just keep going. Nectar and pollen that they're bringing back. Nectar is the high protein, uh, is the carbohydrate, and the pollen is the protein. And it's a rich diet. It's a rich diet. Honey contains all these antioxidants, minerals, vitamins, enzymes. The pollen gives them the, also the same proteins of all type. And three types of bee bees in that hive. From the majority of the bees are workers. Those are females. Those are bees that do the females that have been, never been able to be mated because their female organs hadn't been developed because they weren't fed a rich diet like the queen. And so they do all the work, all the work over the millions of years. They clean the hive. They feed the baby bees. They guard the hive at the entrance will die for the hive by stinging another bumblebee or whatever trying to attack, stinging a skunk that tries to get in at the entrance. And boy, did I, I got a good video of a skunk. The bees all of a sudden, it kind of knocks something hard there because all of a sudden it shows. All of a sudden the skunk and, and just runs off. It's a great video, a guy from Sterling who had the video. I've seen it and it was so funny to uh, see. Uh, but anyway, they do all work. And uh, I said to my wife even, I said, something happened over the years. It was the girls did all the work. Why do I have to work now? <laughs> if this had followed true, I should be able to kick back and you should be doing all the work. I said, right. <laughs> and of course, the male bees, drones. They're there for one purpose, mating purposes only. They've got a playground, they usually hang around on the two outside frames and having a good time. Whenever queen, they'd go out in the morning to mating zones where the queens would go and get mated. And of course, the sad part, that they, the mate, drones would mate and then they die. And those in the fall that are there, they kick, all the girls kick them out. Hmm. The new beekeepers that don't know this, they kick them out and they're in the cold grass. You know, it's cold at night, there's all dew on the grass. They go out there and see them and they won't let them in. I said to my wife, I said, look, poor guys can't even go back in and be warm. She said, that's the way it should be the human race. <laughs> Imagine that. <clears throat> and the queen. 
egg weighing machine, 15, 1800 eggs a day. Amazing. We, we tracked that too with the USDA study with Jeff. Uh, we got queens that were laying 1800 eggs a day. 1800 eggs. Can you imagine just one after the other? Hmm. They, we now know Tom Seary's study. They take only two trances, they go into a trance twice a day for about 15 to 20 minutes. Nobody knew that until three years ago when this study came out. They thought they just kept laying land, but they take two transient periods and they just relax. But the rest of the time, they, to keep up with every six weeks bees are dying, to keep up with the numbers, that queen's got to keep going. And that's when the bees, when she runs out of sperm, then guess what? have to replace her. And that's natural. For bees, they know she's not doing the job. They supersede her, replace her. But she's the key figure in all this whole dynamics. And here's a beautiful picture taken by my friend. This is a house uh, adult bee coming in from the field. This is the house bee. It hasn't been out. First two weeks of a bee's life, they stay in the hive and they do all the work in the house. The field bee comes in they put their tongues together and the house bee sucks out the nectar from the honey stomach of the field bee so the field bee can quickly move out and get more. And it's a beautiful partnership. You see that in the hives. If you want to know how when the nectar flow, you see that all the time, that connection of, pro, of the two proboscises, the two tongues. It's a job that they all know what to do. Amazing how this is so organized. And, you know, they just know. And here's the god bees with their Mazinoff glands. Guess, you see them. You see the god bees. They got those Mazinoff and fanning. And as the bees are coming in, uh-oh, there's my hive. You know, because all bees in one hive, they all smell the same. With us, we smell different. And as a result of that, the fanning process, that's the reason for it to let the bees know, this is your hive. Here's a house bee, see how it's cleaning out a dead larva? Takes it right out. They don't allow any dirt or filth in that hive. And there's the water gathering bees. Don't think about it, first two weeks bees can't go out of the hive, but the first two weeks are what? The larva can't, the pupa can't, the nurse bees can't, but they all need water. Here's how new studies repeat themselves and update. Nobody ever thought about that before. Again, Miles Spivak and Tom Seeley combined in a study and found that there's a group of water gathering bees. And what they do is bring back water. That's why they're at, the, at your uh, swimming pools and everywhere else. They're bringing back water to the nurse bees to feed the baby bees. The house bees have to drink. And now, not only for the water and drinking, they're all, guess what they're all doing? They're all those, that heat, 93 today, like a day like a hot human, they can't, if it goes much above 96 degrees in that high, you get suffocation. So they bring in water droplets, put them on the frames, and then fan, keep the temperature. And they thermoregulate that high between 91 and 96 degrees during the brewery. It's amazing. Thermodynamics, aerodynamics, there it is, close up. This is the Mazinoff gland. Beautiful picture of bees. Isn't she cute? Look at it here. It's nice girl's eyes. Structure. And here's the nurse bees. This is the one I like to watch. They go up, chew the honey in the pollen. Then they come down, and we don't know it. But when we have babies, you know what they do when they want to eat. Start crying. These, they start releasing this pheromone that says, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me. And I can imagine to the adult bees, the nurse bees smell this. Imagine, they must be going nuts. All these, every four hours they have to be fed. Every four hours. So all these little baby larvae, Releasing that pheromone, feed me, feed me, feed me. And these nurse bees running from one to another to another, just keeping them fed every four hours. Mm. That in itself is 
to me mystifying how he's, that would drive me nuts. <laughs> I said to my wife, she says, that's amazing. And here's the drone, carefree, on the sides out there, girls do all their work, the queen, they only go for the mating flight. What a life. And here's the queen, their gland machine, her grooming, her quarters all around her, they groom her, they feed her, they do everything for her. All she has to do, when a bear comes in tax, you know what they do? And a number of studies show me, the first thing when a bear not in this danger, they all fall around her, protect her to the fullest. The queen is the most important, they know it. There's no question that they know it. And they'll protect her and try to scoot her off away from the danger. And that's the whole dynamics of this we have working together. The worker bees, drones, the queen, they keep this hive going. She goes in, puts her head in, looks if it's all polished, and, and this by the way, this was in, uh, published my fellow school teacher of mine, uh, had this picture, I think it was um, American Bee Journal had published this picture. He took this picture of an egg. I pulled the queen out, put his picture, and the egg was still in the ovipositor. He got this great shot, and then it, they, uh, not, not that it was big money, but he got it to be put into uh, the uh, bee journal. So there's the egg, the queen, laying the egg. And in three days, it hatches into a baby larva. And then they stop feeding it. And egg after egg after egg, that queen goes 1,500 eggs a day on average. From starting in March, sometime even in February, or January, depending on the need. And then they hatch out in three days. They feed them for seven days. See them? All those, feed me, feed me, feed me. White lava. They cap it over, it turns into a pupa. The pupa is not fed, but they have to keep it at 93 degrees. And this is the thing I love the most. And some of you beekeepers remember this when I was at your houses. I always love to do this to a new beekeeper. They say, how's, how's my hive doing? How's my hive doing? Uh-oh. What's wrong? What's wrong? Uh-oh. What's wrong? I take the tweezers and I stop pulling the cappings away. What's wrong? I pull the cappings away. And you can see, in the meantime, here's the little bee. Once I pull the cap away, look at with the two little legs trying to, because it's so tight in there, pull up. I watched this whole process. It's 35 minutes. Hmm. Jeff Pettis and I went out there. We eating our sandwich. We watched the whole process. We left it there to see time it. It's 35 minute process. Look at here, out halfway, but stopped and resting. And finally, all sweated up after 35 minutes of struggling. Well, what I do is all of a sudden I take the tweezers after I pull away the cappings and pull the little baby out after saying, uh oh, what's wrong? I say, it's a girl. <laughs> you know what the question is? How do you know that? How do you know that? What's well, a work of me? Oh, that's right. But anyway, look, isn't she cute? Samantha, little brown eyes, yeah, <laughs> so cute. And in an hour, she's working. She becomes a worker and starts working. And that's the cycle they go through. They go out, gather, once, after two weeks, they gather the nectar, they gather the pollen, the two necessities of life. And this, this particular one, we took away the pollen, weighed it, that pollen weighed more than the bee itself. Jeff, Jeff still got the stat on that. The weight of that bee and the weight of that pollen, the pollen was more than the bee that came off of that bee. And yet the aerodynamics come back to a hive of two miles. Thermodynamics, aerodynamics, these bees have got it all. And here's, they store it for winter when there's no pollen out there up here in the Northeast. They store the honey. They gather as much as they can in the fall. They're getting prepared for a long winter, putting the nectar in, then they fan it, fan it, 
Right now, some of you beekeepers may say they're not capping the honey. Why? Because the rain, so much moisture is in that nectar. And so as a result, they pack it in because they have no space. They still got to get that moisture from the bottom of that cell. So they got to keep fanning. It's a slow process. In years we don't have so much rain, they cap it quickly. Yeah. I had to consult with some of the experts on why it's taken so long. But the more rain, they got to still get, they'll still pack that cell even though it's not evaporated. And they got to keep doing it until the bottom part underneath all that moisture comes up and, and get, they get it out. You got to have honey's 18.2%. Moisture or less. And there's the capping process after. And then the other product they make is wax. They build wax with the honey, the, the net that they produce. That's what they store everything in, build a nest with. Such a complete, and she doesn't look happy, does she? This is Annabelle. Annabelle's not a happy camper. You know why? The last thing bees produce is propolis, the sticky, gluey stuff. To glue everything up. And we thought that for years. See how research opens up? We now know that this is antimicrobial. This stuff protects against disease. They coat the sides of the, we used to all scrape it off all the time. Now the studies have shown clearly, leave it. It's antimicrobial. Bees fight disease. And so now they even selling stuff coated with propolis. That, but that comes from the residents of plants from pine trees. And to get that off, you ever watch, if you're a beekeeper, watch them trying to get the propolis. I've watched that process. Watch that where the propolis is, and you see the other bees coming to the aid and chewing and, and pulling off the propolis and using it to cope. And organization, how much better could it be? Here's the baby girl bees, the baby boy bees, you know, so they don't think too much of baby boy bees. Up above the babies, the pollen and the honey. Now the nurse bees have to come up here and get pollen and honey, and guess what? They got feed it right there. That's the way hive sets up. They're pretty good at doing what they do. And if you got enough good year, and you're a good manager, you get all this extra honey. And we all hope for it, but nowadays, not so important to get honey. But my dad, it never was. Then, so as long as the beehive lives, we get a little bit of honey, that's fine. That was his philosophy. Well, and, I, and I carried over, you know? And, uh, but they need the nutrients. People feed, take the honey and feed them sugar syrup. Not the same. There's no nutrients. That's the other cause that they're studying now is that what's happening too much. We're feeding them too much sugar syrup, not enough nutrients from honey, leaving enough honey, and also not leaving enough pollen. Or letting them go, and I even added to what my dad did. I trap 100, 115 pounds of pollen a year that I have in starting in January, I put it into my sugar patties and give them pollen. I'll tell you, you want to see a difference in the development of a hive? It makes a big difference. Instead of pollen patties, because if there is pollen, it's down in the bottom, they can't get to it. They're up high, it's cold, so I give them pollen. I found a remarkable management difference. A number of beekeepers are now doing the same thing. And bees swarm once a year, and this is the natural process. But the sad part, the swarms don't make it on their own because there's nobody to manage them. Bees need human beings for survival, no question. I've tried to have five bee trees on the side yard next to mine. Every one of them died without treatment within a year. So that's a queen cell they build. And then the old queen leaves would Half of the bees, 30% of the bees, that's the way bees propagate themselves over the years, is by multiplying their numbers. Mm -hmm. But it's not working anymore. 
That's the set. That's why if you let them swarm, people say, well, my dad used to say, let them swarm, they'll repopulate nature. That was fine. They would. Nowadays, they'll ah, just let them swarm, I don't care. Yeah, but they're not going to make it. And that's the sad part of it. You're wasting these poor bees. Unless you can get them down and start another hive, then that's fine too. And don't blame honeybees for yellow jackets. My dad used to always say to people, oh, it's probably yellow jackets. No, no, it's honeybees. They was all of my soda can and trying to sting me. But it's the yellow jackets. Notice no hairs on their body. The single set of wings, really bright yellow instead of orangey color, a different design. So don't ever blame the honeybees. There's my the highs, the Polish colors, red and white. I only after my dad passed away, I was able to get away from the red and white colors. But he wouldn't let me get away from red and white. I had to make sure we painted them all red and white. And that's how he was my mentor and taught me everything I know about beekeeping. That as a media, my dad's house. 294 people showed up. It was one of the bigger ones tended at anybody's house. We had four workshops that day out there. And, but it's fun. Join the beekeeping organization. I'm going to take a few minutes now just to talk about the hobby beekeeping and then take some questions and answers. Um, like I say, honey is obviously bees are the main focus on why people keep bees now. Survival, help the bees stay alive, keep them going. But Obviously, there's no question in my mind, because every beekeeper, I go out to a new beekeeper, do you think I'm going to get honey this year? Do you think I'm going to get honey? And I say, well, you never know. But the first year is pretty tough. And you can see it drop their face. Could I just take like one frame and extract it? You don't even want honey. It's, it's just natural. So, you know, you can get, like I say, all kind of honeys, even around here, Except we don't have enough crop of one particular type to be able to get one honey for the most part. You can do it, but it's hard. You've got to take off right at the end of that crop, and then you've got to, um, you know, spin it out at that time. But, you know, you can get like this dandelion. This is some actual dandelion. Crystallizes very quickly. Uh, this I extracted this year. This is pure dandelion, 90% from Quarry Hill and Oxbridge. Uh, it came in great this year. Some years down the line, no flow, like many plants. And then you can see the extreme. Buckwheat honey, down the line honey. The two extremes in between is all type of amber colors. And you know, you can not only get honey that's jarred and spin out, liquid honey, you can make comb honey. And a lot of the old time, the Polish, the Greeks, the Egyptians, they love the comb honey. I have to produce about 200 something squares of this because I got a demand for it every year. If I don't, they, they kill me. Oh, well, you don't have my comb honey. So you have to produce the comb honey for them. And of course, the honey is the nice part because, like I say, you can, then the wax, what do you do with the wax? that you uncap the, you know, uncap the honey with. You can see here in this frame, it's all capped over. When honey is done and pure and ready, the bees cap it over. They, they cap it over. That means it's ripe, ready for the winter, except that they make so much extra that we can take it, take the uncapping knife, and spin it out for ourselves and leave them 80 to 100 pounds, put the frame, the empty frame back in. I've already extracted some honey. Uh, I have one lady that she'll take every bit of it for making mead. I call it a waste, making mead, fermenting it and make it into wine. But she loves dandelion mead. So you have the wax, what do you do? You can make beautiful candles. My, my daughters used to make these candles, paint them all up to her friends and give away for Christmas time. You know, and burning candles have a beautiful fragrance. There's no soot coming off them and a nice, nice smell at dinner time if you've got, uh, you know, pure beeswax. You know, hand creams. Also, beekeepers here can tell you, nice a moisturizing cream. Here's a healing cream on, get a little cut or whatever. 
you know, put it, put it right on there to keep them from getting infected. Beeswax soap. You can make soap, you know, from beeswax. Lip balm, you know, chop lips. This is excellent. So all kind of wax products with honey. Not only that, but you can cook with honey. And, you know, apple honey butter. Instead of apple butter, apple honey butter. Instead of raspberry jam, raspberry honey jam. I'll tell you, that adds raspberries and honey make a beautiful combo. You're making jelly, jam, the jam particular, I like honey with strawberry jam, raspberry jam, any of those adds a nice little touch to it. And, and even people now started making, this is called mead jelly. They take mead, make it into a jelly, put on their toast. And they gave me this, they said, Ken, you get up in the morning, put some mead jelly on, it gives you an extra boost. <laughs> and so you got that, and the newest thing with honey, as part of this hobby of beekeeping, is making honey mead, peach honey mead. There's a whole new world of meads, honey and different fruit, and some great, great combos. That's about 15% alcohol, uh, so Molly don't think about it. Uh, and honey bear, real nice stuff. If you have Rushford's, try Ken's honey bear. Cooking with honey, this book was put up by Worcester County Beekeepers. Some of my grandmother's recipes are in there, my mother's. Uh, cooking with honey is fantastic. You use only use half an amount of honey as you do sugar, but it tells you how much you use and all kind of great recipes. Hobby honey has so much that uh, you know you can do with the hobby of beekeeping. I see now families, years ago it was only the all old guys like myself. So I've been around a long time, I've enjoyed a hobby, I always will, and it'll go to my, uh, my, my will, my ashes are going to be spread by my bees. <laughs> my wife wants to join me, so both of our ashes will be spread, and my daughters um, are going to show that. So bees and me have been life, so I'm sixth generation, my youngest daughter's going to be high, she's the seventh generation beekeeper that's taken over. Not to the extent of myself, but she's done. So anyway, with that, I'll leave it open to questions. And I've had, I had bees for about three years. Then year after year, I've had, uh, I had two, I had I mean, three hives and they, they died every winter. Okay, why they died? Yeah. I can tell you right now, there's one of three reasons. First of all, there's mites. If you don't treat for mites in June, in August and at the end of September, there's too big of a gap. They take too, when that mite gets into the bee, into that little larva, it just sucks the life, life blood out of it. And so they're weakening. So you got to treat three times a year, knock down the mite levels, keep them low. That's why I said in a while, bees won't survive. When bees are untreated, they will not survive. There's the answer. I was only doing it once a year. They what? I was only, do, I was only treating once a year. That, that, there's your answer right there. There's no way you can treat once a year and get away with it. I've tried all combinations. I've tried with the studies. We've tried so many different things. That was a good part. I learned so much from the scientific end. Um, so, and then the other thing is, even if you do everything right, if, if the neighbor down the street has bees that are dying from the mice or from the viruses, your bees are going to rob out that hive, and guess what they do? When they make contact with live bees, with virus, it's like us with COVID, person to person, live virus, you're going to commit. We, I don't know how many samples we sent to nobody is looking at the virus levels, and those virus transmit, the more bees that are robbing, the heavier the virus levels in those hives, and those levels, at some point with the weakened immune systems, they just can't combat the virus. So it's a combination of mites and treatment for mites, viruses, and then everybody in the neighborhood within the range of your bees is doing the same thing. That's why I say, nice to have a lot of beekeepers, but the problem is if everybody don't do the right thing, we're hurt, they're hurting everybody else around them. So I say if you're going to stop beekeeping, 
let's do it all right, you know, and, and work together. And we have to. To save the bees, what can you do? Put pollinator plants. Look in the computer, pollinator friendly plants. That are going to help the bees, because you know what? What used to be all these goldenrod fields, Joe Pieweed, Shepherd's Nowy, is now these big housing developments. And you know what? I go and I kid, I kid my neighbor. He's got, I call him a $10,000 lawn. You know what kind I'm talking about? Like a rug, yep. not a clover, not a weed. All those lawns, instead of fields that had goldenrod, Japanese knotweed, milkweed, we no longer have that. So the bees don't have the balance of nutrients that they need for all, all the honeys to do the job and keep themselves healthy. I saw all the different things that came in over the years. From the Zima, I saw it come in in 1954. I saw the, uh, uh, one of the mites that come in, tracheal mite, that came in in 1970-something. I saw a chakru come in in 1964. I've seen this stuff as it's come along, it's a little bit smaller. And so the bees are challenged, there's no question about it, and hopefully we can help them overcome because they need us now more than ever. It's a love affair, man bee and flower to survive because we need them for our food mm -hmm. they need the plants for their food and the plants to produce the vegetables and food for us need the pollination so it's a three-way street so to speak we have to uh you know keep fighting the fight for the bees right. and planting pollinated plants Instead of one, let your lawn go, let some clover come in, let some uh, dandelions come in, some, yeah. you know, start a beehive and run it right. That way you're helping, you know, the, the honeybees as well. So three times we have to treat for the mites, keep them healthy, and then we always have to watch out for failing queens that the new queen might not get made and go back to the hive. And so you've got all these other things going on, bacteria, so they need us more than ever because there's so many things that they're getting hit with, they just, it's a struggle for them. I love them to death and when I see these, like in the spring and I see some of them dying and they're slowly dwindling, it really breaks my heart. I, I love honeybees, yeah, I love the honey, but to me the bees, it's a love affair between me and the bees as well.